Uh, my name is Walter Frick. I'm an editor at Harvard Business Review. Thanks, everyone, for joining us for one of our HBR live chats. I'm here with Orly Lobel, a law professor at the University of San Diego and author of Talent Wants to be Free, as well as Jim Besson, professor at Boston University and author of the book Patent Failure. And we'd originally set out to talk about Tesla's patent sharing. Uh, and I think we've uh, there's been so much interesting intellectual property news in the last week that I think we also want to make sure we touch on Aereo uh, and a couple of other things in the same vein. So it should be a pretty interesting discussion. Thank you both for being here. Thank you. Thank you. So to start, uh, I've talked to you both about this uh, already a uh, week before last, but Tesla uh, made kind of an interesting announcement, I guess, week before last at this point. Uh, Elon Musk came out and said uh, that, I guess the exact words were, Tesla will not initiate patent lawsuits against anyone who is not essentially a patent sharing agreement. I think the phrase open source patents was even thrown out there. Uh, but I'd love to hear actually kind of how you interpreted this and what actually you see this move meaning strategically and, and what do we not yet know about it. Right. So uh, I think we've heard some commentators uh, either being very uh, enthusiastic about it, thinking it's um, some people think it's just a marketing strategy that uh, is trying to signal that Tesla is being altruistic. It cares about it, its mission, so it just wants to share the knowledge with everybody so that there's going to be more electric vehicles out there. Um, I think that it's more than a marketing strategy, it's really a market creation strategy. Uh, what's going on is that uh, Tesla sees its competition right now, not uh, the, the very few others who are making EVs, but rather the, this huge billion dollar market uh, of, of cars, of gasoline cars, and it wants to increase its market and the, it wants to increase to build uh, technology, to bring, build infrastructure, and it can not do it alone. And I think also what Tesla is doing, it's, if you look back in history, it's not something that's brand new. This, this is the kind of situation, the kind of action that has come up when major new technologies come along. And I think the key to understanding it is what Musk said that the, the real competition is not the rival electric vehicle manufacturers. The real competition is the gasoline-powered car. Um, when you have that sort of economics in the early stages of an industry, to, and, and when there's real benefit to ha having the electric vehicle manufacturers cooperate on standards, developing knowledge, complementary knowledge, charging stations, whatever, infrastructure, um, there's all sorts of benefits to sharing the knowledge with other electric vehicle manufacturers. And effectively, there's little penalty uh, at this stage of the game economically in terms of having them uh, compete away the profits from innovation. Uh, the comp because the competition is really with the gasoline-powered vehicles, the gasoline-powered vehicles are determining the, the prices in the marketplace and effectively determining the profits that the electric vehicles can make. Uh, so they don't, they don't have this uh, tough competition where they're uh, for, you know, competing away the profits. Sure, so that, that makes a ton of sense. And, you know, the electric I would say that it's not only oh, that there's ahead. not a real penalty. Yeah. Yeah, yeah I was going to add that uh, you know, there, there are several factors. Uh, and, and as you said, that we don't know exactly um, what the statement uh, really means or how they're going to interpret it. Um, the, there, there's some skepticism about whether this is uh, you know, truly open source, um, where uh, what Musk actually said was that they won't litigate against those who, in good faith, uh, use their technology. And there, there's a question of what good faith actually means. So um, one question is whether they're thinking about cross-licensing. And they, they want others to come in and 
uh, bring in more technologies that will reduce costs, that will uh, contribute to you know making building the infrastructure, uh, allowing more uh, technologies in the batteries, um, or they're just opening it up for for more competition. The uh, the questions or, or the issues Orly raises have to get at the sort of one of the second major purposes of patents, uh, which is to use the for for a startup, which is to use them defensively. In other words, what 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 Musk has said is basically the, these patents aren't very valuable to us in terms of keeping other uh, electric vehicle manufacturers out of the marketplace. But he's hanging on to them, and what he's talking about there is that they may be valuable in 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 defensive terms. Uh, if other companies come after him, them and, and sue Tesla, um, they they will have these patents to at least threaten the countersuit, which is and, and may eventually lead to the sort of cross licensing that uh, we've seen in other industries. Yeah, well, uh, I guess with that, uh, the flip side of that, uh, and something that we've talked about uh, for previous uh, articles in Orly, I know we talked about this is. You know what is the value that they're giving away? If the assumption is that they're trying to build up this market, you know there must be presumably some value that they're hoping competitors will latch onto in order to grow the overall EV market. So, uh, I guess I just want to push back a little bit and ask, what is that value that they're giving away? If the primary value of patents is defensive, if the value of a Tesla vehicle at the end of the day is much more than patents, uh, what do they hope is the mechanism by which this will actually grow that industry? Right, so I actually looked up, you know, what kind of patents Tesla has, and there are some some commentators initially were quite skeptical. They they talked about how uh, they probably don't. Uh, a lot of times, patents really don't tell you a lot and anything, or at least uh, not a lot about how to really get to the secret sauce of a new technology of of a you know very competitive product. Um, and and I uh, think about this a lot. That uh, difference between what you see in the patent disclosure, you know, what how much it enables um, others to to actually create the technology. There's there's a real gap between that and the the trade secrets that Musk is not giving up. Uh, there's going to be a lot uh, of know-how and tacit knowledge that still uh, will give them a competitive advantage. But I will say that when you look at their patent portfolio, um, yes, there's some very trivial patents. There, there are a lot of uh, patents that are related to the car design that are not that interesting. But there are um, patents that are really at the heart of building electronic vehicles and, and the, the batteries um, and, and the, the superchargers. Um, so I think that there both thing, things are going on. I think that um, when you offer up some sort of open source uh, model of, of your patents, you're probably thinking about what happens next and, and how you create value from um, the need for consulting, for joint ventures, and Tesla will definitely be at the frontier of that. So if BMW comes into the picture and, and others uh, start uh, more seriously looking at electronic vehicles, they'll all need Tesla to get from the patents to, to the actual product. Um, but the other thing is I think that um, there is uh, a real hope with Tesla that um, they're inviting others to build more more stations, more supercharging stations, more um, cars that are kind of they're standardizing the, the market in a way. So I think that um, they're they're thinking about all the kind of byproducts that will um, will be in, in in demand in greater demand when there'll be real competition. Well, and, uh, and another thing is that some of these other companies are going to develop new knowledge or have already developed new knowledge. And Tesla may benefit from that as well. Mm -hmm. So I, I'd like to generalize a little bit and, and get at maybe you know for for those watching whether this is something that actually is you know potentially a model for other firms and other industries or is is really particular to the case here. And, and so I guess there's a couple of dimensions to that. Uh, one is 
it sounds like this is to a large degree something that makes sense in terms of new technology areas, uh, perhaps rather than business in general. So I'd love to hear if you think that that's the right way to think about it. And then the second piece is, um, to what extent is this really true in all new technology areas? So on the one side, I could imagine the answer being something like, any new technology uh, needs to kind of have this standardization when it's just getting started, and so this sort of IP sharing is a really important way to get there. On the other side, I could see an argument that says something like, well, actually, uh, automotive is just this sort of really infrastructure-heavy industry, and so, you know, the charging stations are this almost uh, bizarre thing where there really needs to be a lot of cross-industry collaboration in a way that isn't true in other industries. So I guess I'd, I'd put to both of you, how broadly can we generalize from this to other sectors? Well, we've seen historically uh, uh, many other cases where this sort of thing happens. Um, where the ge and, and what the historical evidence shows us is, is one of the key limitations, is, which is these periods don't last forever. Um, so when the early textile equipment manufacturers were in initially sharing things, after a couple deca decades, things got much more competitive, and they stopped, and they relied on patents much more in the traditional way. And, and this, this tends to be the pattern we see, that it's an, it's an early stage phenomenon. It's not just about key infrastructure like charging stations. It's also about all sorts of other standardization of knowledge. Just These are often very complex technologies. There are lots of things to be figured out, not only in how to make the machines, but how to use them, how to build them, how to install them, how to maintain them, uh, the business models that come out of that. Um, all of that knowledge is, is uh, basically acquired through experimentation, and the more experiments you have going on, the faster you're going to get to, uh, you know, an efficient, uh, uh, common standard. Uh, but once that once that standardization starts happening, um, then things can get very competitive, and there isn't that much uh, uh, additional rationale. Or, or well, the the, the economics that I talked about where you have, where you're competing against an older technology, where, where Tesla's competing against the gasoline-powered car, or where the early textile manufacturers were com competing against uh, uh, weavers at home uh, on hand looms, uh, once the, the, that, competi that competition is, is dominated, um, the, the economic argument for sharing with rivals falls apart, or at least becomes a lot weaker. That's why that's why things ultimately ultimately end and ultimately change. Yeah, so I agree with the with what Jim said. I would just add that um, in the tech industry or in the computer software and um, in you know Silicon Valley large uh, computer companies, there's it's actually very common. So um, the cross licensing um, patterns. So. Um, Actually, quite recently, Google issued um, an open patent non-assertion pledge. Uh, IBM did that even before it, it kind of publicly announced that it's committed to not assert patents to to those that are um, putting in uh, or using their patents for open source. Um, and and just cross licensing is 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 just the way that they they work. Um, and the other the other part of it is that um, in these early uh, stages of a new industry, um, the, the clear pattern is that, that the incumbent has a very big advantage. And so we talked about this already with you know how Tesla is always going to be the first mover. It's going to have that advantage of um, others coming to it uh, to to you know get. Their consulting get, um, or, or they're going to stand. They're going to have the lead in standardizing. Um, so I think it's a smart move on their part. Um, and the among the other kind of things that they're trying to to build, other than um, infrastructure and uh, just technology, technological innovation and uh, reduction of costs, I think in this market, as in other new markets, it's really about building more of the consumer patterns or consumer demand, which is something that they care a lot about. Because again, they don't see their competition um, as even there in the in the EV 
market, they see it as shifting consumers away from something that they've been using for, for many, many decades. Yeah. I just want to yeah, mention there, quickly... There are a couple anyone... other uh, examples. I was just going to mention quickly, if anyone has questions on Twitter, you can use the hashtag HBRLive, or you can leave a comment on the Google Plus Hangout page, and I'll be checking both as we go through. Uh, Jim, back to you. So, so there are a couple other th things we see in Silicon Valley or, or, or other places where people are trying to sort of formalize these relationships. Uh, Twitter, it, uh, uh, I believe it was last year, put out a defensive patent pledge where they pledged to only use their patents defensively. Uh, Jason Schultz and Jennifer Urban have devised a defensive patent license, which they'll, I think they're unveiling later this year in a, in a, in a bigger form, but uh, it, it's a way for companies to guarantee to their engineers that they're going to use their patents in a positive way and not only defensively, basically. Um, in, in addition to the pledges that uh, Orly talked about, there's, there are organizations like the Open Invention Network uh, for Linux developers where basically they're building a pool of patents. Uh, they won't use these patents. Uh, the, the, uh, basically the patents are shared among people in the pool. Uh, they, they also have these patents as a defensive uh, tool against people who might sue the Linux developers. So they're there are a lot of people out there experimenting with different sort of contractual arrangements or other formal means to, uh, to you know, to, to formalize these these uh, sorts of concerns. Well, well, I guess what I would ask about that is, you know, what's changed? What's driving that? And we've talked about it a little bit, but I think it's interesting to think about this. Uh, how the, how might things be different than they were uh, 10, 20, 30 years ago? And uh, Jim, I know you've written about this and uh, I believe have argued that essentially the value to innovators from patents has decreased for various reasons over time. Is it is it fair to say that uh, the IP is less valuable in some way than it used to be and that really it's about um, trying to make sure that the legal costs associated with your IP strategy are minimized rather than trying to capture value? Is that a stretch? Um, no, I, I think there's some industry-specific things. So I wouldn't say in general the patents are less valuable. Uh, if you look at something like, say, the pharmaceutical industry, they're probably more valuable than they've ever been. Um, but where they're, where they're not very valuable is in software and some of the software-related industries. Um, 30 years ago, there weren't really very many software patents. Software was not used. You're seeing even as recently as 2008 where we have numbers, the majority of software, pa of software startup firms are not getting software patents or patents of any kind. Majority of software IPOs were not getting patents of any kind. Uh, on the one hand, so they're, they're not, the traditional software firms aren't benefiting a whole lot from the extension of, of patent coverage to software. On the other hand, you have this tremendous explosion of litigation over, largely over software patents. Um, it involves patent trolls, it involves companies suing each other, so there's a huge rise in litigation costs. Um, and, and I think that's, that's what's at least part of what's different about the, this, uh, the environment today, that people are much more concerned about having the defensive protection from patents, uh, much less concerned in, in software in particular about having, um, being able to use patents to exclude competitors. They're, they're, in, in the software industry, there are too many other ways, uh, and firms don't rely on patents uh, as a rule to uh, earn returns on their innovations. There are lots of other ways that they do that. Well, we, we just had a question come in uh, that asked whether it was the case that uh, firms are sort of bifurcating in their strategy. In, in one camp, a group of firms that are trying to be more open uh, to either only use patents defensively or to open source their IP, and then in the other camp, the rise of, of patent trolls. And, and So I guess the question is, are these two camps sort of separating from each other, uh, whereas previously firms sort of pursued a more standard strategy? And I would add to that, uh, in Tesla's case, I mean, to what extent do these sorts of strategies depend on reciprocity? Does this only work if other 
uh, electric vehicle makers decide that they'll do similar things so that the industry as a whole can benefit. So I guess those are two questions in one. Are, are we kind of splitting in terms of how firms are pursuing these strategies uh, and do industries need to get on the same page in order to gain value from these strategies? I think let me take the second one first which is um, Tesla probably still gets some benefit uh, if firms uh, don't necessarily reciprocate, but boy, they get a whole lot more if firms at least participate in forming common standards, and even more if firms then start sharing some of their own knowledge and own advances. Um, so it's um, re reciprocation, I think, is, is not necessarily crucial, uh, but it, it uh, maybe in the bigger picture, it's uh, extremely important. Um, we, we've always had patent trolls back to the 19th century. Um, and, and I think it's important to distinguish patent trolls from technology licensing companies, which is a different business model. Uh, what you're seeing today is a huge uptick in patent trolls, largely because uh, of weaknesses in the patent system, in, in weaknesses in patent quality, uh, weaknesses in, in having large numbers of patents on software and methods of doing business that probably should never have been granted but in any case have very vague boundaries and, and, and are able to claim all sorts of things that have typically often been already been invented. Um, so it's, a, it's an open door to litigation um, and, and, and that's why we're seeing a huge, a huge uptick. So it's, to some extent that's that business model of uh, acquiring patents simply to uh, assert them. Uh, it, it's been around, but it's been, it's been a separate business model from the beginning. On the other hand, I want to distinguish and say that there are technology licensing firms. You know, very often a startup will develop a technology and will then license it. Um, and, and, you know, that's, that's a, a, a very different model from, from being a patent troll. Um, and, and it's one which has much more in common with what uh, the kind of thing that Tesla is doing. Tesla may end up licensing some of its technology and, and passing on not just the patents, but also some of its uh, know-how and, and uh, technical knowledge. Yeah. Well, the, the question about the bifurcated market is, of course, at the core of the, the recent patent reforms uh, or the efforts for, for some uh, reforms um, and, and the, this question of whether we can really label some entities as just patent assertion entities or uh, even more negatively trolls and those you know uh, great companies who are producing technology and, and innovation and they're not really interested in litigation I think the uh, the real story or the reality is much more messier than that bifurcated world um, there's and, and that's the reason actually uh, the um, the, the patent troll bill uh, just a few weeks ago um, failed at least for for now in uh, before the Senate that it's there there are many different interests uh, and and kind of contexts where um, there's a question about um, how patents in certain industries benefit incumbents versus startups or entrepreneurs and um, with some of the proposed reforms, the anti-trolling reforms, uh, there was a concern by venture capitalists that um, the, their investments uh, will be uh, at risk where um, you know, everybody's agreed that it's going to be harder to litigate, but um, it, the, really the, the burden will, will be uh, more costly on, on these newer companies. Um, I think that it, it really depends on you know what's creating the value um, in in software. Um, this is the the very recent uh, ruling um, that I maybe we want to talk about with the um, Alice in software. What's going on is that um, as Jim said, there's a real uptick in litigation, but there's also a sense that um, so many software patents are uh, are getting invalidated or they're really uh, the patent office is granting patents um, for for innovation that is really not 
patent eligible. And so um, I think there's more of that um, idea, and, and, and this is what's contributing to these statements that we're seeing that uh, we're only going to use our patents defensively and not uh, assert them. There's an idea that even if you have a long patent portfolio, it's very uh, difficult to assess its value, and 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 a lot of these patents are are really uh, are not going to hold in court. So the court's ruling uh, last week seemed to limit the uh, ability to patent software, but in a fairly limited way. I mean, it didn't necessarily set out a very clear uh, set of rules in terms of what can and can't be patented, and didn't necessarily get to the heart of uh, you know what counts as sort of an an abstract idea uh, when it comes to being articulated through software. I mean, did will this ruling what uh, how software firms go up or the risk that they face in terms of litigation, or was it too narrow and too uncertain to really have much of an impact? Well, one one of the judges on the federal circuit, the appellate court, that made the last decision before the Supreme Court warned that if the ruling came down this way, uh, it would mean the deaths of hundreds of thousands of software patents and business method patents. I'm not sure that she's right about that because it, it, it all depends how the details get worked out in the courts, but I think it has the potential for uh, making, making some big changes. Um, I think it's probably not sufficient to solve the problem, but it, it's possibly a step in the right direction. Yeah, so the court was uh, very explicit. Justice Thomas, uh, in, in a unanimous ruling, stated very clearly that um, this is not a decision that rules out software patents. Um, it's really specific to um, how you um, cannot remove, you know, building blocks of, in this case, uh, what they call it the modern economy building blocks, but just you know, business models that have been prevalent for for many years, and just kind of in the end, uh, say, and you use a computer to implement them. Those kinds of software patents um, should, are, are very much at risk now. You know, everybody who who got and, and they were they were granted. Um, in high numbers, those uh, are uh, probably um, just just not going to hold. And but but that the the um, Alice ruling itself is actually not so different from a line of of these kinds of rulings of, of Bilski before that and and Mayo. They've all said that you need um, some kind of technological innovation. Um, it's just not enough to say here's an abstract idea and you can implement it in a computer or in, in some other kind of testing or step um, and, and that will be uh, enough to, to be an eligible patent. Well, we're running out of time and I want to get to a couple more questions uh, in just a minute, but maybe just for two minutes uh, since it just happened a couple of hours ago. The Supreme Court ruled against Aereo, the uh, TV streaming service. Um, I'd love to have one of you maybe just give us the background on that case and then maybe get your, your two cents on whether it was the right ruling and what it means for uh, TV streaming and copyright going forward. Well, I, I wrote a, a short piece for, uh, for you guys at HBR on Aereo before before the Supreme Court ruling, and um, I'm with the dissent on this, so my views are known. This is uh, the case where um, the the big broadcasters sued Arrow, an online streaming company, um, saying that that's copyright infringement. What they're the, the technology that they're providing, which were individualized antennas that will allow the end user to watch, um, you know, any any kind of over there uh, broadcasting. Um, for free, uh, that that kind of technology is uh, infringes upon uh, copyright. It's it's a public performance because Arrow is providing the the technology, and uh, this is a um, the the ruling that just it just came out a couple of hours ago. So I actually have not had the chance to read the entire um, decision, but this is a very split decision, uh, six to three. 
um, where um, it, it just seems like the majority um, was uh, so convinced that what Arrow is uh, providing is a service that's similar to the cable networks uh, and or the, the cable providers um, who do pay transmission fees and they said uh, well that so that has to be um, a public performance just like um, we've, we've deemed or actually Congress has deemed uh, cable providers as a public performance actually overturning some previous Supreme Court cases. And uh, Justice Scalia in the dissent says, oh, this is really guilt by um, resemblance. And, and he just uh, disagrees with the, the entire analysis, the entire interpretation of uh, um, how, how we're reading here uh, the Copyright Act. So there was some uh, some commentary that I saw prior to the ruling that was making the case that basically this was a business that was trying to be sort of true to the letter of the law while violating its spirit. Um, given that you're uh, with the dissent here, w would you take issue with that? I definitely would. So this is uh, very much part of what the debate that we should be having about copyright protections, copyright, and and also. Uh, patent law where uh, the, the whole idea is that you're um, granting a temporary exclusive monopoly over some uh, kind of information or knowledge or design or technology and uh, you know in patents it's all the time a build around in order to not be uh, at risk of infringement and here again uh, with, with copyright um, they they very much wanted to um, try to avoid the the letter of the black letter of the law, and um, you know the, in, in intellectual property we're trying to balance that we're trying to say whatever has been deemed infringement you know that's out that's off limits but we want to encourage the next steps of innovation we want to encourage disruptive technologies, and here what they effectively did in this decision is. Um, burnout, uh, I think the number is $100 million in, in that specific venture, uh, in, in that investment, and also just kind of a, a chilling uh, message of you, know, you want to um, come up with a new technology, uh, there's always that risk because we're going to read the spirit of the law and, and that might be even uh, broader than, than what uh, you've interpreted before as infringement. So I'll ask one more question uh, from our audience, and then I, I want to ask uh, kind of a final wrap-up question. But uh, we, we got a question that asks why now specific, you know, we talked a little bit about the way uh, that patent strategy has evolved over time, but uh, can we read anything into the timing of Tesla's announcement? Uh, did they feel that they had reached a certain barrier in terms of the defensive portfolio they had? Uh, is it a sign in, of desperation around really a need to get the EV market moving uh, in a way that it hadn't been so far? I mean, is, can we say anything about whether this is a sign of weakness or strength or why they chose to do it you know, this quarter rather than a year ago or a year from now? I certainly don't have information to answer that. So I think what, what I uh, remember, it, so Tesla has been around, uh, what, for um, a little over a decade, I think, and um, and they're producing only 200,000 cars a year, while they're seeing this enormous market of uh, 100 million new cars annually, and you know, two billion cars, uh, gasoline cars, overall. Um, I think they they have reached a point where they um, they think that. They've spread out, um, I think, 100 stations, charging stations in the United States, only 20 in Europe, and, and it's, it's going to be very costly to, to create many more of that. Um, they, I think they feel like they need the, you know, the, the next steps of um, opening up and, and uh, creating more competition.
Well, at the risk of uh, vastly oversimplifying, I'm going to end by asking uh, directionally where you see things going. I mean, I think we see in all these topics we've just touched on, uh, we have Tesla uh, offering to you know share its patents, only use them for defensive purposes. We talked a lot about how there are other companies going in the ne that direction. The Supreme Court uh, acts to, at least in a limited way, uh, limit the way that software can be patented. And then the flip side, uh, potentially a chilling effect on certain kinds of innovation because of the area uh, in the copyright realm. And then uh, a couple weeks prior, the death of a patent reform bill that would have attempted to try and limit certain behavior by so-called patent trolls. Um, is one of those two forces going to be winning out in the next couple of years? I mean, will more open IP strategy be the norm over the next several years as we uh, companies try to cope with essentially the, the growing cost of litigation, especially if you're talking about the software industry? Uh, or is there sort of no end in sight, you know, this, uh, the, the necessary policies aren't coming and we're seriously going to con uh, continue to see stifling effects because of such significant litigation? So if you look at the graph of litigation, it's a hockey stick. Um, you know, just it's the number of lawsuits, the cost of the lawsuits is, has been accelerating. Um, Mike Moore and I wrote a book, Patent Failure. It came out in 2008, and we looked at a graph then, and it looked like a hockey stick. And we said, if this isn't fixed, this is going to be a bad situation. <laughs> and and if, you, if you look back now, 2008 is, looks like the low point of the, of the hockey stick. So... Things are, are, are continuing to, get, to deepen, uh, maybe I should say worsen. Um, I think part of the open source movement it has its own rationale aside from litigation, but I, I think in terms of the litigation aspect, um, you know, you're, you're seeing what, what, what's interesting about the patent reform is, is that uh, it, it had a, a political momentum that wasn't there a couple of years ago when the American Invents Act was passed. The, there was a whole new patent law that was passed in 2011 uh, after seven years of, of lobbying and battles that, that didn't deal with these problems of patent quality or patent trolls. Um, the reform effort that just went down in flames uh, may not have been the best approach, but what, what was clear about it, it was that it involved a much broader spectrum of businesses across the country who were now being affected by patent litigation. And, and it's not just trolls. It's Trolls are a big part of it. They're a majority of the lawsuits, but we're also seeing a big uptick in corporate, you know, like the smartphone patent wars and and, and other corporate, intracorporate or intercorporate uh, patent litigation. So what we can say is that the you know the the problem is getting worse, and and the the rescue is not there on the horizon. The, the the Congress does not seem capable of dealing with anything in the short run. The Supreme Court is taking steps which. And it's taken a number of steps after, over the last four or five years, which have been in the right direction. Um, we haven't seen them ha have the positive effect that, that, that many people would hope they would have. Uh, and, you know, whether that uh, just needs more time, we'll, we'll wait and see. But, 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 it, but it's, cl it's quite clear we're into very uncharted territory, and that hockey stick curve seems to s still be going up. Yeah, Jim and I are uh, in agreement on this. I uh, I'm quite concerned about the expansion uh, on all pillars of intellectual property. So, we talked about patents and we talked about copyright. Um, there's also a huge uptick in trade secrets, and I think um, and 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 in my book, Talent Wants to Be Free, I talk about a lot of expansions that are really under the radar, uh, expansions of the ways that we control knowledge that goes even beyond intellectual property of uh, non-competes that go into the into human capital. And I think what we're getting caught up in, uh, or what's going on with with the courts and and some of uh, the industry, is that there's so much of this conviction that intellectual property is property and you know we have this, this right uh, that's uh, almost like a natural right in, in uh, inventions and, and innovation whereas you know we're forgetting that intellectual property is all about striking the right, right balance and it's all about the purpose of promoting not 
uh, impeding progress in arts and science. So, um, you know, it, it's good to have these kinds of debates and these kinds of reminders that um, there's a purpose to intellectual property. It's not just, you know, to, to enforce the law, because the law says, you know, this is what copyright is or patent is. Yeah. Uh, well, I think on on that uh, on that note, we conclude with the theme that you know help is not yet on the way, but uh, that's where we are for now. Uh, thank you, Orly. Thank you, Jim. Thanks to everyone for joining. Uh, thank thanks for asking questions. I know we didn't quite get through all of them, but thank you all so much. <laughs>